So again, welcome everyone to the FAC Policy Forum. Uh, good to see such a nice turnout and a lot of people here. I'm David Morse. I am the chair of the FAC Policy Committee and a member of the FAC Governing Board. Um, and we'll be playing moderator for you for the next hour, and, uh, hour and a half or hour and 15 minutes, however long the forum itself part portion of this goes. The structure this morning is we have four um, very interesting panelists with us to, to speak about a number of different issues. We have some set questions to ask of them and to hear their responses on. Uh, at, we expect that to go for about an hour and 15 or an hour and 20 minutes, after which we'll take just a very short break for people to catch their breaths. And then we will go into breakout rooms and we will discuss and explain the breakout rooms we also have a, a Google Jamboard for people to post questions and comments on. And so we will explain all of that when we get to the, uh, when we get to the breakout portion of this event. Uh, we do not have the chat enabled and that is just to cut down confusion. And again, because the idea was for the Jamboard to kind of serve both for people to be able to ask questions and make comments but also so that we could preserve a record of the conversations that we're having so that the fact board may then be able to use that for future discussions. So once again, I want to welcome everybody here, want to acknowledge up front and thank for being here, the president of FACT, Debbie Klein, wave Debbie, hi Debbie, uh, and executive director, Evan Hawkins, and all of the other FACT board members who are here and to thank the members of the policy committee for all of the work that all of you did in helping to put this together. Our panelists, I think they can probably introduce themselves better than I can introduce them. Uh, Lizette Navarrete, Leticia Pastrana, Catherine Squire, and Sam Foster. Uh, so I'm just going to first off call on each one of you just to very briefly, if you would like, to introduce yourself. So Lizette, would you like to go first? Hi, good morning. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, FAC. Uh, and thank you, uh, David, for moderating this. My name is Lizette uh, Navarrete. I'm the Vice Chancellor for College Finance and Facilities Planning at the Chancellor's Office. Um, I'm grateful to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Leticia. Good morning. Um, I echo all the thanks that Lizette gave. Um, thank you all for the invite and for all your hard work to organize this. Um, I teach English as a second language at Imperial Valley College. Um, I am a full-time tenured faculty member, but um, I did my PhD and focused on um, adjunct faculty in the community college. So I kind of mixed those two points of view. Thank you. Thank you, Leticia. Thank you for being here. Uh, Catherine, please. Good morning, everyone. Again, thank you so much for the invitation. My name is Catherine Squire. I'm the Vice President of the Student Senate for California Community Colleges, um, and I'm also a student studying political science at San Joaquin Delta College in Northern California. Um, and yeah, just again, excited to be here, and thank you so much for the invite. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And Sam. Sam, unmute. <laughs> you know, you have to know that was going to happen. Okay. <laughs> so I'm Sam Foster. I am the uh, I am the South representative for the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges. I also chair the Educational Policy Committee for the for the State Academic Senate. I am a faculty member also at Fullerton College, and I've been teaching for more than 25 years. Perfect. Thank you. And thank you again for being here, Sam. So it's been pointed out to me that as I was thanking people, uh, I miss thanking our FAC staff, which I most certainly do not want to do because we absolutely love our staff and FAC has a wonderful staff. So again, don't, don't want to miss that one. I definitely want to say thank you there as well for all of your effort. Yeah, this wouldn't be coming off without Lydia and Ashley and, and Stephanie and all of our staff on this, so thank you. So we have, once again, four questions. We have one question each kind of designed for each of the panelists, so we'll start, you know, each one will go first to a different panelist 
but all of the panelists are more than welcome to jump in and to make their comments on each one of the questions. So, and I am going to very briefly share the comment on the question on screen as I ask it, and then I'll take it, take that PowerPoint down so that we can see faces rather than see a PowerPoint because that would be a really boring hour and 15 minutes if that's what we were doing. So, um, well, at least that was my intent. There we go. Okay. All right, so first question for um, Lizette is for you. What evidence do we have that the student-centered funding formula uh, is successfully supporting the equity efforts of colleges in the system? And what would be the process uh, for adapting the formula if it's found not to be fully effective in achieving system, regional, and local goals? Thank you, David. Um, so one of the things, as many of you know, the student-centered funding formula was adopted for a variety of reasons. One of its principles was to advance uh, equity and success, particularly around students that have uh, not had historical access to um, many of the successes uh, when compared to similar students. There was also a, a parallel dynamic that was happening across our system, and that is the very real decline in FTES. Um, just now, I mean, we're seeing that continued trajectory and, um, you know, the, the numbers are, are real, um, you know, the year prior to uh, the adoption, uh, we saw a heavy decline. Those have continued now, um, just since the adoption, we're down um, over 100,000 FTES. That's not headcount, that's our FTES. And um, so these are, you know, these, this is a real trajectory that was happening. And so, what is happening now is that colleges have the opportunity to not um, be so reliant on growing new students, but really focusing on the students that you have on your campuses, the students that need your efforts, your work, um, and the great academic quality that you are providing them as faculty members. And so it gives us an opportunity to focus on, on them without having to risk further reducing resources for your campuses. And two, colleges and districts can make gains on two other important areas, enrolling more low-income students and connecting them to financial aid, and then successes in transfer, um, CTE, among others. Around the topic of connecting more students to financial aid, we've seen- for keeping me from being I'm not sure where that came from, but okay. Um, so around the topic of enrolling more students to financial aid, and particularly Pell, let's stick with that for a little bit. Just this year alone, we've seen the federal government give resources to our colleges based on counts of Pell recipients. We know that is a metric that is important to track and that's important for California to increase. We're leaving federal dollars on the table uh, under the CARES Act, we didn't fare very well compared to other states or compared to other segments of higher ed because the number of uh, students that we have that are enrolling or are applying for financial aid through the FAFSA are lower than in other places. Like, that's an area of growth. It's a benefit to our students. We connect them, we give them financial aid to start covering more of their uh, cost of attendance. Um, and it, it could be a benefit for colleges. One exciting thing that I know many of you have been asking for, and I've been working hard to deliver for all um, for the system so that you have access to this, so that we can begin having conversations about moving, um, moving the principles of this policy forward. Uh, Later today, we'll be launching the uh, Student-Centered Funding Formula Dashboard, the SCFF Dashboard. It's the first phase. Um, it's a first of three phases, so it's very preliminary data. 
but it allows us to start looking at what's happening. What you'll see there is a comparison of SB 361. You'll see some of the trends in enrollment declines and where we have opportunities to collaborate, grow and focus on getting more students again connected to aid as one of the like one of the bigger buckets um, in the formula, which is again uh, supporting uh, more students um, in their financial assistance. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to you, uh, David. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lizette. Uh, do any of the other panelists, um, Leticia, Catherine, Sam, do any of you have any response, any comment that you'd like to offer on that, that question? Well, I would like to say um, that uh, we applaud the idea um, of connecting students to financial aid. I think that's really important. Um, I, I wonder uh, to what extent that we understand why students are not applying for the financial aid, as such as, such as they are. Uh, I, I'm always concerned when we design something to fix a problem without understanding fully what, the, what causes the problem to begin with. So I'm wondering, do we have any data that suggests why students are more reluctant to apply for financial aid that they may be available, that may be available to them rather? We've had several variety of reports that have done on this topic. Um, some of it, each of them identify varying reasons. Some are um, just this longstanding notion that our colleges are affordable because we have $46 a unit in fees uh, and waive uh, those fees for um, students across California that demonstrate need. And this culture of needing additional resources for the other scaffolding that goes into attending college, housing, food, transportation, et cetera, that we haven't made real progress on changing that culture on um, providing that scaffolding to our students. So this is really beginning that conversation. Other technical reasons we found is that in some regions of our state, um, data hadn't been provided to our districts and it has been, we provided this data to colleges and districts um, a couple of times this year so they can make these updates. But we provided something um, that they can use to update a factor known as the local cost of attendance. That is a factor that's used to help students qualify for aid. And it takes into consideration how expensive it is to live, work, and attend uh, college in the region that that student is living. Some of our districts hadn't updated this factor in up to 10 years. And so if you think of areas that have seen ex uh, excess or extensive uh, cost, think of the Bay Area or other urban areas in our state, uh, when their financial aid packages were being crafted, wasn't taking into consideration what it costs to attend college there now in 2021. Um, and so those are all important pieces. These conversations have emerged more because we've essentially looked under the hood to figure out what's happening. Uh, and I think we look forward to seeing more of those conversations because we, again, we see a benefit to students, but also a benefit to colleges. Great, thank you. Leticia. Uh, I'm sorry, Lizette, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, Leticia or Catherine, no obligation, but do you have any reaction? Or, Leticia, go ahead. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd like to just make a, a suggestion that I would like to see for potentially adapting the formula. Um, instead of just simply tying this funding to, you know, graduation measures, um, also thinking about tying it to the composition of faculty um, so that you know, as the faculty body reflects the composition of our students, um, because that shows us that, that, you know, when students have faculty that look like them, their success increases. And that's something that we really need to happen. Instead of seeing, you know, increasing diversity in the faculty as a separate issue, you know, tying it together um, 
that was my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine, anything or are you good with this one? Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and add on a little bit. I think, you know, um, the, the supplemental allocation and just based on the numbers of students receiving the College Promise Grant, um, the Pell Grant and the students covered by AB 540, this is definitely helping, you know, our equity efforts um, and producing more of an uh, equitable need for those who fiscally can't afford college. Um, which is disproportionately our students of color, right? So I, I really think this student-centered funding formula um, is, is bringing to light some of those issues of racial equity. Um, and again, like, uh, um, like some of the other panelists have mentioned, you know, just the need for, for us to address basic needs. Um, I think on the other hand, you know, one of the metrics for funding is based on success or um, transfer rates, attainment, attainment of degrees. Um, and we haven't seen through various studies, um, we, what we have seen through various studies is that the true cost of college um, is making it to where our students, students of color still aren't able to finish. Um, and so I think it's, it might be you know, dependent on us rethinking our success metrics. Um, because we're focusing on outcomes, there's, there's also been some evidence that, you know, these methods um, may not, pro like, aren't producing equity, but it definitely incentivizes our institutions to make steps towards that. So just something to add that. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. If there's nothing else on that one. Hey, well, if, I could, if I could add a little. Go ahead, Sam. Sure. Go ahead, Sam. Oh, okay. Uh, so, um, one of the concerns about the outcome metrics, um, there are a couple of concerns about the outcome metrics. Uh, one of them is that um, they don't take into account other outcomes that students may have as goals. So, I think about in my class, um, in one of my classes this semester, uh, about a quarter of the class their uh, their goals are to, to fill requirements for some other, for some other program in which they want to get. So they won't graduate, they won't transfer, they won't, and so they won't be measured as success. Um, the other concern that I have is, um, I you know, I wonder to what extent might it incentivize behaviors that allow that allows colleges to more. Um, well, I'm thinking of the word that would, I'm trying to put this delicately, but basically the, to sort of skew their populations toward people who are more likely to complete in order to get more funding. So I want, I, I concern a little bit to the extent of those two, those two things with, with the success base of the outcomes base that it may actually do the opposite of really what we're hoping to do. Absolutely. Yeah, if I can add to that, I think one of the one of the advantages of being part of the community college family, like all of you are, is that we are a system that's designed to be open access. We don't turn students away. And so that is something we're not seeing happen. We are enrolling, we are doing more efforts, we're seeing your colleges do more efforts than ever to try to get students to our campuses in whatever modality we're able to teach them now. And so that, I think, as we unveil more resources and more dashboards to look at that, we, we should look at those, we look at what's happening. Um, but we're not seeing that happen now. Again, one of them is the advent and the beauty of designing a system, a community college system that is open access that will take the 100% of Californians that want to come to our campuses. On the area of um, what's happening to low income students and their trends for success, that's something we're very interested in looking at. Very preliminary findings were showing that um, for Pell recipients, these are students that have a zero EFC um, or low income. We're seeing um, in two-year data, obviously this is very young, so we can, we're only looking at very early stages of data. We're, we've seen an ADT increase of 39%. 
Uh, for transfer to four years, we've seen increases of 7%. And so these are things that we'll continue to track that we want to see what's happening because those are exactly the students that we want to look at and why um, it's been such a priority to put data out there that we can all engage with together. Just a point of clarity, you, you said those increases were for um, the students of color and disadvantaged students that were in, those, in those degrees that you mentioned? One, the measures that we have available to work with are um, Pell recipients. And so we're looking at uh, zero E of C, so essentially students uh, lowest income tiers within our system. And we've seen those preliminary increases for, for, for low income students. Can I ask a follow-up question? Uh, good morning. Hey, hold on, Danita. Hold on. Um, we're going to hold the, the audience questions at the moment. That, that's kind of the intent behind the, the breakout rooms is to, to get everybody and to get all of the attendees involved in, involved in the discussion. And I believe the panelists are planning to join us in the breakout rooms, you know, each one in one of them. So, um, so we'll have a chance for, for those follow-up questions. But, uh, yeah, but and, and, and just to follow up, so there's no way to disaggregate that data by, um, by things like race and ethnicity? We, I, I sure hope we can. Um, that's part of um, phase two of the SCF dash, dashboard is we wanna look at how we, we can look at uh, race and ethnicity as well. Um, can, I, can I add, um, Sam had mentioned uh, a worry about incentivizing behavior that would kind of privilege students who we know are gonna complete and, and was that you said that, um, you know, we're open access, but I could tell you from my experience as an ESL instructor, ESL doesn't count for anything. We're not a success because uh, students don't complete a certificate or a degree in ESL. They continue on in other areas. Um, and recently, you know, we've had to close 16 classes uh, because we're not seeing the numbers of students. And it turns out that our students must uh, take an entrance exam, um, which is offered the first day of classes, and only there's only eight spots. Um, so you're seeing a decline in students, but because these students are not counted as success, um, they really don't have the access when we have eight spots available for new students. Um, and um, there's, there's barriers that, you know, do abound. Um, it's just important to look for them. I wanted to mention that because I won't get to chat with you um, in the breakout room. Thank yeah, you. and I, I'd love to have a conversation about that, what's happening there. Uh, if, you know, most of our um, ESL classes are happening in non-credit, and non-credit, as you know, um, the formula doesn't apply to non-credit. The formula, um, uh, non-credit remains funded at the old rate that it, it existed, you know, three years ago that existed under SB 361. So the prior formula, no changes were made to non-credit. And so if something's happening there, we'd wanna look at it probably from a different lens it's, and there may be other root causes that are not necessarily this formula. So we're happy to engage on that and how we can solve that because we definitely don't want to reduce access for ESL students. Yeah. The, the, uh... The connection there, yeah, thank you, Lizette, and thank you, everybody, for your comments there, and we can continue the, the further discussion of this in the breakout. Uh, just to make my own comment on that, Lizette, yes, the, um, that is one of the things to look at, the interaction of the funding formula with some of our other systems and restrictions and regulations, the idea of having a discipline that was largely formally credit, now moving into non-credit, when for example, non-credit faculty don't count in the faculty obligation number creates all kinds of different problems, you know, in that sense too. So there are some interactions on some of those things that also need to be, be considered. But let's move on to the second question. And I'm gonna go uh, first to Catherine with this one, if I can once again, get my screen share to work. Uh, come on, there it is. What is being done and what should be done to ensure that our efforts to increase student access and progress are not negatively impacting academic quality or lowering standards? And what sort of data would we need to determine that they are, that, that is not happening? So. so, Catherine, do you have any thoughts first? 
Yeah, definitely. I, you know, I think at the institutional level, um, we definitely just need to keep investing in our support services uh, programs like Emoja, Puente, EOP, um, you know, are really vital to student success just because those are, those are really the communities that students become a part of, right, when they come to campus. Um, they're where they're connecting with other students that have similar backgrounds to themselves, where they're getting academic help. Um, and so those are really, I guess, part of this holistic approach to, to, to having students be academic, academically successful. Um, I think also just expanding the reach of our communication so students actually know about those resources and can access them is super important too. Um, I think especially, you know, currently given the times we're in and being in an online environment, um, it's super vital for students to have those, those kind of points of contact to go to. Um, and so, yeah, that would pretty much be my answer to the question. Oh, thank you. Terrific. Uh, any of the other panelists? That, yeah, Lizette, go ahead. You know, I think you raise a really important question about how do we sustain um, resources for programs. One of the things you may have noticed in our budget is that uh, COLA was provided for certain categorical programs, but not all. Um, it's applied to those that have a, a, you know, a, essentially a statutory increase. Ideally, I'd love to see us provide these resources to more of our programs because, you know, to have a consistent reach um, in these that are, you know, connecting with students. So I think you raise an important point uh, and how we sustain not only the, um, the, the, the people the, the, and programs that are helping our students during this very vulnerable time. So I appreciate you raising that. Terrific. Uh, Sam or Leticia, any thoughts on that question? Yeah, Sam, go ahead. Sure. Um, the other part of this question was talking about what sort of data we might need to determine whether or not we're impacting um, sort of academic quality or student success in some way. And I think that's a really important piece of information because oftentimes what we see are things like uh, throughput data that says uh, this percentage of students went through and that may be great but the numbers of students that actually gone through may be substantially less so even though we have increased throughput the actual raw numbers of students that we're serving may be less in some of these programs so it's really in, in some of these situations where we've increased access um, and so we need to be very careful in how we analyze the data and decide how we are helping students to be successful and to progress to their degrees. Um, I'm not ex that concerned, I think, that uh, about lowering academic standards per se, because I think our faculty do a wonderful job of, of trying to maintain their, maintaining their, their standards. But at the same time, we want to make sure that um, Students are not being disenfranchised and become invisible because we're looking at numbers like throughput, what percentage of students that start, finish. Great, thank you, Sam. Yeah, that's, yeah, there is definitely a difference as you're looking at different kinds of data between, for example, looking at raw numbers of students and looking at the percentages of, of, uh, of success. Those can give very, very different pictures, so. Um, any other comments, any other thoughts on that question? I just wanted to uh, appreciate uh, Mr. Foster, Dr. Foster, uh, Professor Foster, <laughs> uh, for, for raising that point uh, that, that it's important to, to look not just at throughput, but look at um, how many of our students are succeeding, who are those that are succeeding, where are those gaps in achievement, uh, those are important conversations and data to look at. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, and on the, the title aspect of this, we've got doctors all over the room here, so I just figured it was better to just go by first names on this thing today. So we'll just go for some informality on that. So. Okay, uh, thank you, all of you on that one. The third question is a little more long-winded, and we're gonna start with Leticia on this one. Um, whoops, hang on one second. 
me get where I need to be. Uh, there we go. Okay, current system-wide efforts to promote equity in hiring practices and increase faculty representation of minoritized groups suffer due to factors such as the lack of sufficient funding to hire full-time faculty, part-time faculty being laid off due to decreasing enrollment, and state-level mandates such as the faculty obligation number that do not promote and actually often discourage faculty hiring. Under these conditions, what can we do to make progress toward increasing faculty diversity? So again, a fairly, uh, that's something of a mouthful, but Leticia, do you want to tackle it first? Um, yes, I would love to. Um, there, we have a very robust body of literature um, with recommendations and toolkits um, that tell us what we need to do to, you know, have our faculty be more reflective of our students and our community. Um, but there are a lot of roadblocks um, because, you know, this literature has been around for, you know, a really long time, a few decades, and still implementation, um, you know, doesn't seem to be um, happening because we've seen actually, I think, um, the numbers um, of diversity go down. Um, so a few things, um, two things that I would like to kind of add to the literature um, so we've gotten tips on the need to um, have brave leaders, um, you know, presidents that when they get um, the final three panelists who are not um, racially diverse say uh, what happened here. Uh, we need um, to have implicit bias training for faculty. Um, I've re read suggestions that hiring committees need to not only have minority representation, but be heavy on the minority representation. Um, but there's kind of two pieces that I, I would like to address. And the first is, um, you know, part-time faculty, because in the, in the recommendations and the studies that have been put out, there really isn't anything um, for part-time faculty. In fact, the, the 2020 um, uh, Vision for Success Task Force by the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force um, specifically stated at the end, like, these recommendations do not apply for part-time faculty. And that is our biggest faculty group. Um, so there definitely needs to be some structured um, training for department chairs um, and a consistent, you know, training because department chairs do, you know, change over uh, pretty frequently. Um, so they are hiring the majority of faculty and um, from the experiences I've heard from part-time faculty, you call someone up and say, do you have a class? You know, there is no hiring committee, um, you know, minimum quals and, um, what else is there to ensure um, that um, people are hiring along the lines as an institution we feel we should be. Um, the other piece, um, and this is because I'm not a, a policy maker or I'm not a, like administrator, is we need to go back and um, think about um, students. I like to center my thinking on students and students tell us that they want connections. Students feel disconnected um, and, and they come to class looking for connection. They come to the college looking to connect. And we are disconnected in many ways um, due to kind of the neoliberal slant values that really have made students and faculty into um, objects, financial objects. Students are consumers, so students are a source of revenue, they're kind of dollar signs. Faculty um, are not valued for their work. They're valued for um, the cost savings, you know, part-time faculty. Uh, the way we talk to each other and about each other, we have really kind of dehumanized um, ourselves. And I think it's really important to start from uh, looking at these co courageous conversations that the literature describes, that it's important to have courageous conversations around racism and bias. Um, and I know that that's hard because people, you know, if you tell someone you're a racist, um, you're not giving them the space to change. You know, it's what people do 
not who people are. Um, and so by looking at where there's disconnect and why that happens, um, I, I love neuroscience because it tells us so much, you know, humans are wired for social connection. When that doesn't happen, when there's social uh, rejection, they feel pain in the brain the same way as they did um, physical pain. Um, there's so many studies that could help us with this discussion. You know, another study I read, empathy is stronger when the person in pain is the same race as the observer. So when we see someone in pain, if they're from another race, um, our empathy is less. Things that, you know, it, our brain is hardwired to do, if we create a better understanding of that, we can also kind of, you know, with brain plasticity and, and all that kind of fun stuff, we can train our brains to, to react differently. So I think that um, there's a lot of disconnection. I know this is not like the best answer to this question, but it's something we've dealt with for a really long time and we haven't seen the progress we wanted. So I kind of take it to a more you know, global view and we're just really disconnected. Students against students, faculty against students, um, part-time faculty and full-time faculty, faculty and administration. There's just a lot of areas of disconnect and not so much of, of connection. So that's kind of my, my two, two cents for that. Okay, thank you. Any of the other panelists like to, to comment on that question? Yeah, I just want to kind of go ahead and add on to that. Um, I think for the colleges who are still kind of um, are able to hire, uh, one thing that the Student Senate has been pushing for is just to continue putting students on hiring committees, uh, either formally or informally and to some extent. Um, just because like Leticia said, you know, we really need to have um, as many minority members on those hiring committees as possible, but also, you know, students are the ones who are, who are going to be receiving the education um, and um, getting that education from that, that professor. So I think it's really important to have the student perspective um, be on those committees. And then I think I, I really agree with Leticia's just perspective because um, I think we have to work with the, with the faculty that we have if we're having struggles hiring. And I think that also comes out of professional development um, and really just challenging our faculty to, you know, diversify their curriculum and, and reassess their teaching practices. Um, because I think we, we just really need to get them to ask critical questions about what they're doing in their classrooms, right? It's all about, you know, they're, they're the ones setting the tone for the cultures and the, and the um, yeah, the campus culture on campus and also in their classrooms. And so, um, you know, they need to be asking questions about, you know, have they implemented classroom flexibility? Are they checking in on the mental health and emotional well-being of their students? Are they using diverse textbook authors? Um, can students see themselves in the content that the, that the professors are teaching? And so I think those are the kinds of questions that, um, you know, are really going to help faculty connect with students because like Leticia said, it's all about that connection. Um, and I think, you know, if students are able to see themselves in, in curriculum and feel like they have a sense of belonging at their colleges, then they're not going to learn. And faculty are so instrumental in cultivating that. Um, and again, these questions are, you know, really the same in all pathways, whether faculty are teaching social sciences and history classes or, um, you know, physical sciences and math or in biology, it's, it's all the same. So. I think challenging our faculty in that way will really help us, um, you know, help us support student success. Terrific. Thank you, Catherine. That, an excellent answer. And the sad part is that it would have been a fantastic segue into the next question, which is on uh, professional development. But I don't want to segue yet because I want to finish with this one first. But yeah, uh, great answer. Lizette or Sam, did you have any comment to make on this one first? Though? Both really hard acts to follow. And... <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, one of the themes that, that both Athesia and Catherine highlighted that, that I just think are so powerful are just the important role that our faculty are playing right now. We are dealing with some of the most challenging times and I know that, uh, you know, there, you know, we'll, we'll get to it 
place of a new normal soon where we're feeling less chaotic, but um, you've played as faculty such a critical role in helping your students have tough conversations. You've been there with them as our country is going through a social reckoning with longstanding systemic racism. And you were part of, um, as many of us have mentioned, the most democratic institutions in the world. And you have access, um, an opportunity to engage the minds of students. And, and it's such an important role because you can really shape the progress our country can make on these long-standing and entrenched social issues in those daily conversations that can happen. And so I do think that it's valuable what Leticia has called out is um, more courageous conversations uh, and how do how do different types or categories of you know what what we tend to categorize as uh, groups of faculty and how do we just look at you as all of us as students and faculty together working on one um, social change agenda to address the various and important topics that our society needs us to have real honest conversations about. Okay, uh, and I, I wanted to also comment a little bit about a couple of things that were being said. And um, and we'll talk about faculty professional development and working with our existing faculty. That's really, really important. Uh, in terms of sort of try efforts to diversify, um, to increase rec representation of minoritized faculty, um, I think one of the key areas really needs to be part-time faculty. Because even if we had substantial amount of funding, and we and I really would strongly support that, um, in our best funding year, when we had a lot of funding, we had enough funding to hire roughly one percent of of the of the faculty. I mean, to increase the faculty by one percent. And if every single faculty member was a minoritized faculty member, it would still take an enormous amount of time for the full time faculty ranks to reflect the the students around them. However, we have over forty thousand at last check, part-time faculty. Um, so by head count, it's more than two to one, uh, almost three to one part-time faculty to full-time faculty. And so one of the ways we can get additional representation is to actually look at part-time faculty as though they are part of our institution. We put so much scrutiny into full hiring full-time faculty because we know they're going to be part of our institution. And yet for part-time faculty, as Leticia pointed out, we're often like, oh, hey, you want a job? Hey, you know, want, I, I got a class, you know, you want, a, want this class here? Um, and that intentional thinking about part-time faculty as part of our institution, and then, divert, then directing our hiring practices of hiring diverse faculty toward the part-time faculty pool can have results very quickly in diversifying our faculty organizations, of our faculty. And then once they're hired, we can talk about professional development. But I think that efforts need to be put in place to prioritize hiring of, the, of diverse part-time faculty, to recruit, to actively recruit potential part-time faculty from graduate school, from graduate programs throughout the, throughout the state and even throughout the country, if this is really important to us. And that in, free, and in so doing, we also will now have a pool of people who are highly qualified and highly experienced when full-time faculty positions become available. And so um, it seems to me that that would be the, the single most important thing we can do if we really want to diversify our faculty and make them more representative of our students, that we can look at the 40,000 faculty right now. And these faculty come and go and we hire continuously. I, I was um, I was a department chair and we had uh, about 16 part-time faculty. And over the course of of two and a half years, I, I hired over 35 part-time faculty, um, including, and, and, um, and we still had, only had about 16 full-time faculty. 
right? And some of those, five or six of them were still there. So you get some idea of the kind of turnover that we see. And if we're, and if we're very intentional about who we hire, the process we use to hire, then we can make change quickly in our institution by focusing on our part-time faculty. Can I add um, just another comment? Um, I, it's kind of related to more professional development. Um, but in this, along this vein for part-time faculty, um, I've seen a lot of, uh, through professional development at schools and through unions, um, you know, kind of workshops on how to um, be successful in a full-time um, job interview. Um, and, and I find that to be very problematic because it, we, we need a system to kind of teach our part-timers that the conditions of work, you know, that a lot of times it doesn't lead to full-time employment because we don't have the positions. You know, a position, a full-time position becomes available and maybe 150 people apply. And then they might get an interview and then they might not ever get called back. And, you know, the stories that I, I heard from people that I were interviewing, I was interviewing was, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And my answer, I didn't answer them, but is you're not doing anything wrong. It's the system. And so people feel bad, you know, it's this whole imposter syndrome, you know, I'm not good enough. I'm not doing, you know, and people feel bad. And why would people want to stay in a system that makes them feel bad all the time? And then how does that impact our students? So, you know, I, I think that we need to um, also do things at the back end, you know, people who apply, you know, what was it that happened? What were the deciding factors? Um, so that we do motivate, uh, motivate people to continue to try to be part of our system. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Any other comment on that question? All right, then we can move on to the fourth question, which we will start with Sam. Um, I need to move forward on this. Okay. Hang on, that didn't work the way it was supposed to. Oh, excuse me, uh, may I add something? Oh, hold on. Um, no, we're again, we're gonna hang on to the to the audience questions until we are, um, okay. until we get to the breakout rooms if we can, please. Um, okay. Otherwise we'd get bogged down and we wouldn't make it through the forum, I'm afraid, so. Thank okay. You. I think I'm where I want to be now. So, okay, um, Sam, starting, starting with you, what objectives or outcomes should we look for from our professional development efforts and what should we be doing in order to provide necessary professional development to support both student equity and institutional equity at both state and local levels? Okay, so um, I think there are a lot of things that we need to think about when we talk about professional development. And I think we've already started to, started to touch on these already. And the first and foremost is that the faculty that we currently have need to be um, appropriately trained about things that, that were mentioned about diversifying the curriculum, about, um, about techniques in the classroom to, be, to reach more diverse students, about ways to, uh, ways to mentor. And uh, uh, we need to focus a lot of the professional development since we are not going to be able to hire a lot of, of diverse faculty in the immediate future. We need to be able to make sure that we can focus on the faculty that we currently have and train them to be able to be a bit more effective with the student body that they're serving. Um, and along the, uh, also along the lines that we also touched on already is it would be really important to provide mentorship for the faculty that we have. Uh, when new full-time faculty are hired, including faculty of color, often they don't last because they don't feel like they, 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 are, they are integrated into the system or the, um, they don't feel like they're, they're part of the, of the institution. And, uh, and this is also true for other, other new faculty that are hired, but there needs to be a focus in a part of our professional development on the, on the faculty that we hire, and especially for, 
for faculty of color. And also, we need to provide, and again, we touched on these as well, we need to provide on a special professional development for our part-time faculty. Um, I served as the chair of the part-time faculty committee for the state. And um, I was a little bit shocked, I guess, because in our department, we did a lot of professional development for faculty. And I, didn't, and I was really shocked to find out that ex that's extraordinarily rare. I, there were so many faculty that reported that all they got was a course outline and a key. And that was the extent of, uh, and, then they're, and then they may be evaluated on how well they're doing in the class without any sort of professional development, any sort of, any sort of mentoring. Um, and it doesn't serve our students well, and it doesn't serve our faculty well. And for our faculty of color particularly, it, it can put them in a situation where they are unlikely to be successful and unlikely to stay within the system. And so our professional development needs to all, particularly focus also on part-time faculty, um, on mentoring part-time faculty, understanding that uh, in most of our graduate work, since most, most of our degrees, many of our degrees require a master's degree, in most of our graduate work, there's not explicit training in how to succeed in the community college system. And so when we have part-time faculty that come into our system, we need to provide them opportunity to be successful. We need to provide them training about how to effectively reach our students. We need to provide them with materials about things that have worked in the past. So they're not starting from scratch with just a course outline and the key, and then being washed out of our system because they're unable to be successful. Thank you, Sam. Uh, any of the other panelists have thoughts on further thoughts? We've already discussed the professional development a little bit, or brought it up a couple of times, but any further thoughts from anyone on that subject? Yeah, was that, go ahead. Yeah, if I can just add, I think, I think Samuel is bringing up a really important point around how do we nurture support um, our faculty when they do come on board and particularly our faculty of color um, that you know may be uh, entering varying different campuses with varying different um, degrees of you know, um, you know efforts around DEI and so you know if you look at you know bringing it back to the state budget if you look at the state budget there aren't a lot of areas of ongoing funds this year. Uh, you know, it's, you, you see uh, an improved set of resources, but most of the dollars that we're seeing come through are uh, one time. So, you know, what can be done with one time resources to help retain our faculty of color, to help support our faculty of color? I think those are really important conversations that we should be having as part of the professional development conversation, uh, what can be done with one-time resources that can have a lasting impact. I think those are, are important things and areas that we should think about collaborating under um, as we're early in you know, advocacy season. Um, but it, it's an, an important topic to raise, I believe. And thank you for, for doing so, Samuel. Okay. Any, yeah, Leticia, go ahead. I actually, um, thank you, Lizette, um, perfect setup for um, one of my suggestions. Um, one-time workshops, one-time pots of money are great, but they, we know, research shows that they are not effective. Um, for professional development to be impactful, to have lasting effect, they need to be sustained. They need to be systematic. And we had that, but very piecemeal throughout the system. So one of my suggestions was going to be that I would love to see the, you know, the Vision Resource Center as becoming more of a central hub for professional development for the different colleges. Because, um, you know, at my institution, we have, um, we have a center and they do workshops. There's a link to the Vision Resource Centers, which also has workshops. Um, but we're never really told about it. It's just a link. Um, we have workshops where people charge $15,000 to give, you know, a day workshop or $5,000. Speaker fees are expensive. 
And, um, you know, there's a lot of duplication of services, you know, so this person might speak at my college and then might speak at your college and then get paid again. Um, so, you know, I would like to see a central location. And now that we're all on full-time and part-time faculty, because we're doing professional development, development now through Zoom, and we're posting it online for, you know, those who, who can't attend. So it, you know, it opens up um, this professional development for part-time faculty who, you know, traditionally have been excluded. And, you know, this, I, I hear this phrase a lot, you know, we don't want duplication of services. We don't want duplication of services because it wastes a lot of money. Um, so I think it would be great if we had a, you know, central area that, you know, we can do, you know, consistent professional development that's ongoing instead of uh, one-shot workshops, which, you know, really the research shows us just don't work. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Any additional comment on the professional development? Sam? Um, yeah. yeah, I would like to add that, as, that um, in addition to workshops and these sorts of things, uh, it's really important to have a sort of hands-on mentoring program because um, it's really easy for faculty of color and for part-time faculty in general to feel isolated. And feeling isolated and feeling like they're making decisions in a vacuum and they're not sure how well this decision is going to work and they're not sure how well it's going to be received. And, and there's, many, there's much expertise on our campuses that can both relieve the sense of isolation, bring you into the fold, and engage in active conversations, including embracing some of the ideas that the faculty have in themselves. I always find it puzzling that we hire the best and brightest faculty and then tell them to sit down and shut up until you get tenure. So while you have all these fresh ideas, don't use them now wait till they're no longer fresh ideas, and then we'll, then we'll be happy to listen to them. Um, so that, that needs to change as well, that, that this mentorship and, and bringing faculty into the fold, full-time and part-time faculty, should engage a dialogue as we think about the academy and how well we are able to serve our students with the broad base of knowledge and expertise that we all bring to the table. And so beyond just the workshops, there needs to be this sort of active mentorship program and this give and take between faculty and existing faculty, experienced faculty, new faculty, and this free exchange of ideas and embracing of approaches that may help to reach our students better. And that needs to be an important component of all of our professional development if we really want to advance the institution. Okay, terrific. Thank you, Sam. Okay, I'd like to give, and uh, I didn't warn them of this, but I'd like to give each of our panelists just a, a brief moment uh, to make any kind of final overall statement on all of this, if they would like to. Uh, the, the theme, which I should have said at the beginning of this thing, the theme of the forum was putting our money where our equity intent is. And the basic idea behind it was we as a system and as colleges and as individuals are being asked to do a great deal of work in the name of equity. Is it being, are we being funded properly in order to be able to carry out what we are being asked to do was the basic idea behind that. Um, and again, I didn't really, so anything that the panelists are saying on this, you know, in response to this, they're completely winging it. But since we have a couple of minutes left, um, would any of you like to make any kind of final general kind of overall statement on that topic? Then again, maybe not. Yeah, Sam, go ahead. <laughs> Actually, I'll, I'll, you to, I'll you to Lizette first. Thank you, Sam. Um, so I want to mention a couple of things. First, uh, you know, as a system, as um, of community colleges, we continue to be the least funded um, across the all of higher ed. Um, that needs to continue to be one of the areas that we raise 
Um, if you look at um, even just the cost of living increase that was provided to us compared to K-12, uh, you know, it's a 1.5 in comparison to 3.8. These are choices that um, impact what we can deliver, uh, can, that impact our ability to serve more students. Um, and our system serves, you know, over 70% of California's higher ed students. We're valuable. We've proven our value even more during this pandemic as uh, organizations and, and institutions that have been there with providing, um, you know, emergency centers, providing a now vaccine centers for many of your campuses, um, and many other essential services. And so, I just want us to kind of continue that work. I think a lot of really great ideas are proposed today. A mentoring of faculty of color, um, thinking about um, being intentional about our work to support uh, low-income students, students of color. Uh, and then if I may, I just want to um, add that this year has been very tough, but I want to thank the fact leadership. Uh, Debbie, as your president, has been a, a great partner in raising issues that needed to be addressed early on. Um, she and um, your, your great executive director, Evan Hawkins, came to me with a, a, an issue of equity and how we were treating classes that were online fa versus face-to-face -face for certain types of classes. They raised that, they, they talked about um, the discrepancy in those two, how they were being funded. And we um, you know, are, are moving forward regulation changes. So I just wanted to kind of take a pause to just thank them for um, that partnership and raising real challenges that you are facing this year and how they affected resources available to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lizette. Sam, had a final comment? Sure. Um, I know that, that funding is, is, continues to be challenging. And I know that FAC, among others, have continued to advocate for increased funding for community colleges. And that's important that we continue to advocate for the fact that, that we're, what we're really advocating for, we're really advocating for our students when we ask for increased funding. We're, ask, we're, we're advocating for resources that can help us serve our students more completely, more effectively. And so we need to continue to advocate for that. On a local level, we also need to think about um, think about our base budgets. And perhaps we need to include as part of our base budgets, professional, uh, um, ongoing funding for professional development that is targeted specifically to the equity outcomes that we desire. And so if we really, if we really value equity, we need to at least have some portion of our base budget, despite our underfunding, tar specifically targeted to equity outcomes when it comes to professional development. And uh, if, we can, if we really continue to do that, then even if we can't make all the progress that we want to make, we can continue to make some progress. And I think that's really important. If you can't run a mile, if you can walk a block, you still get closer to, closer to, your, to your goal. And so I think we need to continue to, to make sure that we can guarantee that there's at least some ongoing funding for this. So that as Lizette mentioned, when you're planning, for these, um, when you're planning for these these kinds of uh, professional development outcomes, you know there's not it's not, not going to necessarily be a one-off. Mm -hmm. That you can have on, on some ongoing presence because the college values this so much. And in the meantime, we must continue to advocate for increased funding so we can serve our students more effectively. Okay, thank you, Sam. Uh, Catherine, did you have any final comments that you wanted to make, or are you good at this point? Um, I don't have any comments on my own, but I, I just agree with everything that has already been said. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Leticia, anything to wrap up? Yeah. Yes. You know, okay, again, I preface my statement with, you know, I'm not an administrator. I don't have to deal with immediate pressing needs. Um, but I just want to point out that we have become overly sensitive 
to um, funding issues, which it's a reality, you know, the funding streams end, how do we fund programs? Um, but, you know, this jump and you jump has made it so that we're not looking at our long-term goals. We're not looking how the impact of these immediate concerns that we try to address um, have negative consequences for what our long-term goals are, you know, are sometimes contrary to what we really want to happen. And so I, I don't know how we could get there, but, um, you know, looking at the way we connect problems and solutions, we keep doing the same thing in just different ways. So, you know, kind of thinking about how it is we're connecting things and, um, you know, what it is we really want, uh, but again, when you have immediate concerns that you have to address, um, that's not always an easy thing to do. So, yeah. Hey, terrific. So first off, thank you once again to all of our panelists. Um, excellent answers and excellent discussion. We really appreciate all of you taking the time to, to be here with us and to have this discussion.